As we're going to get off into the Word here tonight, I've got a lot of cool things I want to talk to you about. And on last Sunday, I was preaching a message, I called it Fielder's Choice, and was talking about the choices that we have to make, that we have to decide, either we're going to walk with God or we're not, and we can't say we're going to walk with God if we're going to carry idols. Amen. How many of you guys heard that message? You hear that message? And it's like, man, whenever he got up and whenever he lined it out, he just said, look, no, I'm not talking about that kind of walking with God. I'm talking about this kind of walking with God. And there comes a time where the people of the Lord just have to say, I have decided, I have made a decision, and this is a decisive moment for me, and things are different from here forward. There also has to come times where we actually admit to each other, I need to reconsecrate my heart to the Lord. I need a time of rededication where I just go, hey, I mean, I do that with Leanna all the time. I say, you know what? Let's just take off somewhere and let's just go fall in love with each other again. You want to? And she's like, okay. And I'll throw on the back of my motorcycle and we don't even know where we're going. We just tell the kids, we'll be back in a couple of days. Bye. It's like, well, you just can't do that. Uh, no, we can do that. We're empty nesters. Praise the name of King Jesus. <laughs> Amen. I know Leanna went in the morning and wailing and gnashing of teeth when that all happened. All four of my kids got married the same year. They all moved out the same year. I want to tell you, God did that for me. That's why he did that. I love my kids. I bless my kids. I say, leave and cleave in Jesus' name. Amen. But you know, sometimes we just say, you know what? Hey, let's mean you go out to Redemption Ranch or let's mean you just hop on a bike and let's just go somewhere. Where do you want to go? I don't care anywhere in the world you want to go. Let's go. You want to go get on a plane and just go somewhere? Let's go DFW. Let's go. And we actually do that. Like, why would you do that? Because sometimes, man, you just got to put everything else on hold and go, you know what? Nothing works if our marriage doesn't work. Nothing works. What good is it to have an awesome ministry if you don't have, you know, if you don't have a marriage? What good is it, you know, to help people all over the world if you don't even help your own house? What good is all those things? Say, hey, let's just make sure that this works and let's go. And so we do that. And just exactly like that, we also do that with the Lord. There are times where I'm like, hey, let's rededicate our hearts and our lives to the Lord. Let's consecrate ourselves tonight, today, during this time. Let's spend the day of praying and fasting. Let's anoint our house with oil. Let's just redeclare our commitment to King Jesus and our loyalty to him. Okay, well, those are all good things to do. And during these days, in the midst of there's so many things pulling on us and trying to take us here and trying to take us there, that, friends, we have to be the kind of people that we say, nothing will pull me away from the love of God. I have to recenter and refocus, and I have to be the kind of person that knows how to do that because it's a difficult day and a challenging hour that all of us live in. Somebody say amen to that. Well, I thought that on the heels of preaching that word and talking about, you know, choose you this day whom you will serve. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And in the midst of all that and talking about those kinds of choices, I thought I would also continue that same kind of message, but talk about the importance of I am going to perform and I am going to commit to seeing the will of God done within my own life. And I want to walk in the will of God. And not only do I want to walk in the will of God, I want to be able to fully demonstrate where people look at it and go, I thought that was going to be difficult, but it's really not difficult at all. That is God's will right there. And we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he makes it happen. And it was like, well, I'm not sure that he really does that. Oh, no, he does. Well, then we think, well, then the reason why we don't have very much happen is because we really don't know what the will of God is. I want to tell you, a lot of times, the reason why we don't see a lot happen is simply because we got shaken out of the process and we are no longer committed to seeing the things happen. Life happened. Something terrible happened. We prayed one time. We forgot about what if you had to be committed to a prayer for a long time before you see it happen? And what if that's just your ministry to the Lord of, Lord Jesus, I know that 10 million people would have already given up by now, but if you'll just let me, I'm just going to keep on praying for this. And that's your ministry. Do you know, guys, that that is actually a ministry? Do you know that? It is a ministry to not give up. It is a ministry to hang, to, to hang into a place and say, you know, Lord, I've been believing this, God, for a long, long time. But I continue, God, to bring this to you and to bring this to your attention because, God, I believe, God, you've given me an assignment to do this, and it is my joy. I, it, it's not going to wear me out. It's my joy that I get to be the one that brings this to you. See, that's a different kind of attitude, isn't it? Amen. 
Well, friends, today we're going to be looking at the will of God because I want to tell you, not only can you know the will of God, I want to tell you that you are responsible for knowing the will of God. And now I'm also going to tell you this, you are responsible for carrying out the will of God in a way that is tangible. And I'm going to show that to you today, and I'm going to deal with some challenges that we have with that. Guys, if you would please open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Now, I'm thinking about doing a TV show on chapters in the Bible, and like, like the, my top favorite 100 chapters in the Bible that you just got to know. And I want to tell you, Romans chapter 12 would definitely be one of those chapters. Romans chapter 12 is a masterpiece. And it's got so much good prophetic language. And it's got so, guys, the kingdom is in this in such an awesome way. And in order for us to look at Romans chapter 12, here's what you need to know about it. In the, how many verses are in it? Is there 21 verses? I don't have that. I don't have it open. Is, is, there, is there 21 verses in it? Okay, well, in the 21 verses, you can literally divide up Romans chapter 12 in two segments. Verses 1 and 2, which is all about knowing the will of God, and then verses 3 through 21, which is about how we should live and how we should live with each other. And that's it. That's what Romans chapter 12 is about. It's about knowing the will of God, and then it's about God really likes it whenever we love each other. And this is how we should walk in the power, and this is how we should walk in the love of God. But in order to look at the first verse of Romans chapter 11, I'd like to, I'm sorry, of 12, it has this therefore in it. And let me, let me show you how it starts off. It says, I beseech you therefore brethren. Now that's interesting to me because he says, I beseech you. Let me say what that means. He says, I want to appeal to your personal will because we're about to talk about the will of the father. Let me talk about your will. Would you be willing? And so I'm begging you. I beseech, I beseech you. But he doesn't just say, all right, I'm really asking you to wrap your head around this and I'm really asking you to consider this. He says this, I'm asking you to consider this. I'm begging you. I'm appealing to your personal will because you have, you have a choice to make in this. But he says, I beseech you, therefore, which means we have to read the last part of, of Romans chapter 11 and go from there forward. Therefore. Amen. Is everybody still good here tonight? Amen. I love the Word of God, and I love how language works. Amen. I want to encourage you and tell you this. If you're going to have a personal revival, there's a couple of things that uh, you are going to have to do. One is this. You're going to have to get in tune with the Holy Spirit, realigned with the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to learn how to pray in the Spirit. You need to learn how to, you need to, learn how to declare the Word of God. You're going to have to have a realignment with the Holy Spirit within your life. But I want to tell you something else, too. If there's going to be a personal revival within your life, you're going to have a revival of the Word of God within your life life. And you're going to have to fall in love with it and go, man, this ain't no black ink on a white page, man. The word of God is in this and it's rich with it. And I can't get through this life without this. So let's look at the end of verse 11, I should say of chapter 11, which is the there that we move forward from. And I just wrote it down here and I hope I can read my own writing. Let me put my cool glass. Oh, I stole Leanna's cool blue glasses today. I love Leanna's glasses. Leanna, honey, this is where they went. Hallelujah. Okay. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Boy, I can stop and preach on that because the Bible says that there is a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And most people that have wisdom do not have revelation. And I want to tell you, it's easier to have wisdom and knowledge than it is to have wisdom and revelation. So it is, it is knowledge, and then it is wisdom, and then it is revelation. We can go off into all those different things, but we'll do that some other time. But it says, how unsearchable are his judgments in his ways past finding out. My gosh, every time I think I got God figured out, he's like, all right, I'm going to step back a little bit, and I want to show you a little bit more. And then he says, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him, and it shall be re repaid to him? In other words, who among us does God owe anything to? Oh man, I love that. And he says for this, for of him, everybody say of him, through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen, amen, amen. These three different categories. These three different categories. Here it is. Of him, through him, and to him are all things. So he's like, man, if you want to know what it's all about, it's really just all about Jesus. Everything that is going to last is of him. Everything that is alive is through him. And everything that is right is to him. 
Um, if you're like being overwhelmed, somebody asked me the other day about some really spooky things going on in their house, demons manifesting, all kinds of stuff. I recently had a demon manifest in my house, had one show up and spoke in an audible voice. If you guys know that story, it's fine. If you don't know that, but I was upstairs in my study and I heard somebody coming up the stairs and I said, who is it? And this thing spoke and it said impenetrable. I heard somebody say impenetrable. And I jumped up and went to the stairs to see who it was and there was nobody there. Well, Mr. Impenetrable wants to stay hidden because he's a punk. Punk demon spirit coming and telling me that he is impenetrable. We just got through rescuing a little girl, a 12-year-old little girl in Chiapas, Mexico. And like, I don't know how I gave that thing access to my house, except for I was on the worldwide waste of time and I was connected with those people down there. And that joker showed up in my house and spoke. Okay, I want to tell you about Mr. Impenetrable. He's a liar. And he's already defeated. And here's what you need to know. If you can't remember anything, man, remember this. 2 Timothy 2.7 tells us to remember something. And you know what it says? Remember that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And it just sets everything right. You got some kind of devil, some kind of demon showing up in your house, turning on the television. Right? Number one, if that's the worst thing the devil can do is turn on your TV, your two-year-old can turn on your TV. Are you horrified of any other two-year-old? Like, no, but this is supernatural. You don't know that there's a supernatural realm? You don't know about second heaven? You don't know about those things? You're a child of God and you're not aware of those things? Give me a break, amen. Don't be surprised when you have to fight supernatural things. Pull up your big boy pants and cry out like the child of God that you are. Take your authority in the name of Jesus. Don't, and don't sit there and take that mess. Can you imagine if I called you and I said, are you ready for some real terror and some hell in your life? I'm gonna come over and turn your television on. <laughs> You'd laugh at me like you are right now. Why would you be horrified and terrified of something spooky in your house turning on a light or moving an object two inches? What, what six month old cannot do that? Like, but oh my God, but it was a wonder to me. Why is it a wonder to the people of God? Because you don't know the word and because you're not a kingdom person and because you're more into Game of Thrones than you are the reality of spiritual warfare. Wake up in Jesus' name, amen. And let the people of God rise up and go, uh, no, I don't think so. Listen, this is my house and God Almighty gave me authority in this place. I know who I am. I declare the atmosphere of this house belongs to the Holy Ghost. You cannot happen. And here's the deal. You should have never woke me up. You shouldn't have woke me up, devil, because now that I'm up, I'm going to have to walk around in my drawers with my hair all over the place, declaring in the name of King Jesus, every person I know that has cancer now going to be healed in Jesus' name. All my kids and all my grandkids are going to have dreams and visions tonight. And then, oh, no, let's don't stop there. You woke me up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Or, or you can lay there like a punk and go, oh, I hope it goes away. It ain't gonna go away. Run that devil out of your life in Jesus' name. Know what the word of God says. And if you don't know what the word of God says, pick it up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody been telling me lately, man, Pastor, you're getting kind of mean in your own age. No, I've been like this my whole life. It's just, I would much rather be funny because I am funny and I crack myself up and I really enjoy laughing at my own jokes that nobody else thinks is funny. But with that said, there is a new kind of soberness on me where I don't really care if I'm funny or not. This is the word of God and people are dying and the church has got to know who we are and step into our authority and be the people that God Almighty has called us to be. We will not be carried away by sexual things. Can I say that to you? You will not, listen, your children will be not be, hey man, I don't know if you know this or not, but your children are targeted. And if you don't believe it, go to Target and look for yourself. They're after your infants. They're out talking about your infants. They want to sexualize your infants. And if you don't believe me, go down there and look at their infant clothes that says, I may be a boy, I may be a girl. It's a surprise. We all got to find out. Go, go look at it and go see what their agenda is. You know, and the people are like, well, I just hope we can get along with them. I don't want to get along with them. 
You get along with them all you want and you befriend the enemies of God. And let me tell you what, let me tell you what they will do. They will defeat you and they will laugh at you because you were their punk. Man, it makes me mad. And I'm hoping and praying that there's more people in the body of King Jesus that will stand up. Where are the men and the women of God who are not afraid and intimidated and scared to death that they're not going to get enough clicks? Amen. Well, so we go from the there. Like, what is the there? And then we move forward. Well, at the end of Romans chapter 11, as we're in Romans chapter 11, it says everything is to him, everything is through him, and everything is for him. That's what it says. And so from there... He says in Romans chapter 12, and let's see here, what does he say? I lost it. I just totally erased it. Can I have verse one up there? Okay, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I just erased that verse. I'm so awesome. I'm so sorry. All right. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, I want to just tell you, presenting your body and presenting your life as a living sacrifice, not as a dead sacrifice that can't do nothing, but one that is alive, and also, too, it says it's acceptable to God. You know what that means? That means compatible with his presence. Acceptable to God, one of the understandings of, the, of being acceptable to God, which we're about to talk about, means compatible with his presence. Acceptable to God. And then it says this, it's your reasonable service. What that is, this, it's just the reality, the grown-up reality. And, 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 and friends, let me just stop and talk to you about this. One of the big senses that I have is a huge sense of personal responsibility of carrying out the heart of King Jesus. I am so passionate about it. And so I have a very hard time identifying with a lot of people in the body of King Jesus who do not feel a personal responsibility for carrying out the heart of Jesus. And I just don't, I don't know where they're coming from. I, I, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, we're not speaking the same language because everything that Leanna and I have done over the past 34 years of marriage and then four years before that, we dated for four years before we were actually married, all those years... Uh, I can just tell you, we did that because we accepted the personal responsibility of being godly people that made a difference on this planet. And it's one of the ways that I first came to know Jesus. As soon as I knew Jesus, I knew that I was a world changer, and I'd never thought that before. I never thought that I was a world changer. I never thought really I could make much of a difference. And I'd done some cool things before I got saved. I really had, and had written some things that was published and got to do some really cool things. But I want, to, I, I want to tell you, I knew that I had a chance, I had a green light, I had a permission from God, and I had a yes from God to just get after it and to make a tremendous difference. Now, I didn't know how I was going to do that, and I had to find out how to, how to bring God into every single thing that I was interested in and how to die to things that I was interested, th- to, that was interested in that were not beneficial to the kingdom or not acceptable or not compatible with his presence. And, and they weren't bad things. There's, some things are bad, right? Because I'm kind of bad. I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit bad. Oh, I see. Such holy people. Praise God. I need to rub elbows with you. Oh, no, listen. I got a potential for bad that is next level, I promise you. And I think bad things all the time. I, I, and, I, and, and they're funny when I think about it. And then I go, okay, that's not funny because the Holy Ghost doesn't think that's funny. Stop thinking that that's funny. And that's part of my problem with being bad is I think bad things are funny. Okay, it's funny until all hell breaks loose and then you, then you get a bad spank. And I don't know about you, but I hate getting a spank from the Lord. I hate it. I don't like being in trouble with him. And there's been a couple of times I've been in bad trouble with the Lord and every time it has shocked me because I have such a favor of God in my life and I walk with God in such an awesome way and me and God just, I just get along with God really well. I love Jesus. I really do love him. And the times that I've gotten in bad trouble, I'd be like, whoa, I'm in trouble. Like, uh, I forgot I could even get into trouble. And, like, and the Lord's like, well, you need to remember that because I'm not playing with you. And I play with you, Troy, and this thing, this thing, this thing. I told you this, and you didn't listen to me. And now my kingdom has moved back because you are not the leader that you were supposed to be. 
because you thought it was funny. Now, how funny is that now? No, sir, it's not funny. And if you don't know the Lord like that, you need to know the Lord like that because that's where the fear of the Lord comes in. And the fear of God is a big part of understanding the will of the Lord. And what I have come to love is I love the fear of the Lord the same as I love my passion for the Lord. I have learned to love the fear of the Lord. To get into a holy place that is fearful with God is such a big privilege. Like, whoa, 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 man. This is the, man, the presence of God is here. And I'm not gonna, you know, there's a, there's a, you can literally break protocol when you're in the presence of kings by acting a fool when things are serious. Amen. And I've had to learn these things, man. I mean, I've had to learn, and I've learned the hard way. I have literally got in trouble in holy moments where I was not sanctified to the moment. I was just acting like there was all kinds of freedom in that space. There was not freedom in that space. There was privilege in that space. And you have to learn to cooperate with the privilege of God when he moves you into a holy place and says, hey, man, I'm not playing here. You're not playing, right? No, sir, I'm not playing. This is serious stuff. I mean, the fear of the Lord is a big deal. The body of Jesus needs the fear of the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. amen. He, we do. We need the fear of the Lord. And there's no such thing as a revival without the fear of the Lord in it. I'm telling you right now, if there is, have you ever noticed that when there's a great revival, the preachers tend to be mean? Have, oh, y'all never noticed that? Because I sure have. I promise you. You know what? Ben Paul was a big part. Ben Paul sitting over there. And he was, he was Steve Hill's saxophone player. He, he's, he's played for way next level people all over the world. He was Steve Hill's saxophone player. You guys know that? I want to tell you, go back and listen to how sweet Steve Hill's messages are. They're not sweet, and they're not nice at all. They are not nice messages. Like, well, I would never come to that. Well, millions of people from all over the planet Earth came to it. It's called the Brownsville Revival. And the reason that they did was because the power of God was all over it because of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. It's a big deal. Guys, we cannot live without the fear of the Lord. Mm. Man, you guys are like, I'm never coming to a Wednesday night service again. <laughs> Pastor Troy used to be funny, and now he's like in a bad mood. I'm not in a bad mood. I, I see that we have a job to do. Amen. I see that we have a job to do. Amen. Well, so whenever we get into verse 2 of this, of Romans chapter 12, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. There's so much in this verse, and I just love it. One of the things I want to just kind of make you aware of in the scripture that you can search out yourself is I want to just ask you this. There is the kind of, you, I know that you're aware of the kind of transformation that instantly takes place when the God of this universe puts his resurrection power called the Holy Spirit within your life. Amen. And it is amazing. But there is also a process of transformation that you cannot bail on that you have to walk your entire life. And this part comes from the renewing of your mind, which is a very intentional process, and it happens. It doesn't just happen at camp when you're a kid, or it just doesn't just happen at revival at church, or just one particular Sunday. It's something that happens throughout your life where you recommit your mind over and over and over again, and your life is transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, what that tells me is, are you ready for this? Our minds are an issue. Like, well, my mind, I got a cool mind. I want to tell you right now, your mind is whack, and your mind has to be bishoped. Your mind is the realm of your soul, right? And the Bible says that our souls must be bishoped. This is the word of God. What does that mean? It means that you got to set a sheriff up and go, there's a certain kind of way I'm willing to think and a certain kind of way I'm not willing to think. And there's certain kinds of things. I was talking with, with my good friend, and we were talking right before the church service. Like, okay, if something scary is presented to you, and I want to stop and tell you this, the Bible says that in the last days, at the time of the Antichrist, as he's rising up, which I'm telling you guys, we are there. We are living in the last days. The Bible says that a strong delusion will, will come upon the world, and the Bible also says many lying wonders will take place. <clears throat> Lying wonders. Like, what is that? Things that blow people's minds that are not the truth. 
And you just go, hey, 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 what is that? You better. So I want to just ask you this. I'm going to just be a little bit crazy because I've been on a lot of podcasts lately uh, that are not Christian podcasts. I've been on a lot of weirdo, weirdo podcasts, and I've been bringing Jesus to some really cool stuff. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't told you all about it because I'm not real sure how I'm doing yet. <laughs> Oh, when I when I hit one out of the ballpark, I'll let y'all know about it. So far, I'm like, I kind of got my hat handed to me. I don't know. But anyway, I'm trying, y'all. I'm trying. I'm being brave, and it's fun. But I want to just tell you, here's the deal. If a lying wonder came up tomorrow, and they said, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Let's say, let's uh, talk about aliens. Let's talk about UFOs. If one of those things happened, I want to tell you, most Christianity could not survive a UFO situation. Boy, I could... I could in a heartbeat. You're like, whoa, I have too many things to think about. Well, you should have already been thinking about those things. What were you thinking about if you weren't thinking about those things? Game of Thrones, something stupid, some foolishness that does not matter whatsoever. You should be thinking about it. What if something is presented to you that absolutely says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. My entire paradigm is rocked. Your worldview should not be. If your worldview is rocked and you have a faith quake, that's on you. You better be prepared for lying wonders in these days that you don't know how to answer where you go, I don't know what to think about that. Like, I don't know, you know somebody, somebody talk about some kind of spook in the woods or Mr. Bigfoot, man, blast it. I won't be in Canada next week. Let me tell you what happened. This big boy was to see Bigfoot. I'm blasting it is what I'm doing. Like, well, you can't do that. If I can, I will. Hallelujah to the name of King Jesus. And then you know what? Like, well, what, are, what, are, what about this? What about that? I don't know how. There's so many things I don't know how they work. There's so many things. There are spiritual things that have physical properties and physical things that can get into spiritual properties. You do know that, right? You do know about Nephilim. You do know Genesis chapter 6. You do know Genesis chapter 9. You do know the Word of God, right? And you do know that in the last days it will be as it was in the days of Noah. You do know that, right? Okay, well, what does that mean? It means everything that was going on before the flood is going to be taking place right before Jesus comes back. And I want to tell you, there is a lot of weirdness going on. And so it's like, whoa, well, wait a minute. I don't know what I think about this. I don't know what to think about that. What do you think about if you hear something in your room and turn on the light and there's a dude in your room and then he disappears? Like, well, I, just, I wouldn't be able to handle that. Well, you don't live in the same world I live in. Because I've had a lot scarier and weirder things than that take place. And you get off into demonic warfare, and you get off into confronting witches, and you get off into going all over the world, you're going to come across stuff that you do not know how to answer. Okay, I don't know how to answer that. How do you deal with that, Pastor Troy? I remember that Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And then the issue solved. <laughs> it's so simple. <laughs> It's really and truly simple. I remember Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead, and if there is some witch that knows how to astro project into my bedroom, uh, here's the problem. He's taking my prayers back with him. Because I'll tell that devil the same exact thing that I told the last witch that I confronted is the assignment that is on my life works like this. I'm rubber and you're glue and whatever you say bounces off me and sticks on you. And that's about all the theology that I need in the name of King Jesus. And say, friends, you need to know this. I'm praying that you have a revelation of Jesus. I'm praying that Jesus comes and interrupts your life and disturbs your life. I'm praying he shows up in the midst of your pentagram, slaps you around, and says, follow me now. And it's going to wreck your whole little witch world. Well, Pastor Troy, don't you want to know how all that works? I ain't got time to know how all that works. I really do not care. Because I'm not planning on astro projecting any, anytime soon. Now, I can tell you this. I could step into a portal, and God Almighty could move me from here to Azotos in a second. You do know that's in the Bible, right? And some of you have actually had that happen, and you're scared to tell anybody. Oh, I ain't scared to tell anybody anything. I don't care if you think I'm crazy. I don't care if, if it was supposed to take six hours for me to get from one place in India to another place in India, and it took me six minutes. And we have no idea what happened except for what happened whenever we got there and we ended up starting our meeting four hours earlier and even the mayor got saved. Mm -hmm. I gotta go on and tell you, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Like, I, whenever we were on our way back, like, where are we going? Well, we're going home. And I didn't even know it happened until we were on our way home. Didn't have a clue. Like, 
my God, why is it taking six hours for us to get home? Because it's a six-hour drive. Well, it didn't take us but five minutes to get here at the beginning. They're like, yes, we are thinking about that. Well, my God, <laughs> let's think about that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, sometimes that happens. And they're just like, yeah, it just happens sometimes. Come on, have you ever seen a miracle in your life? You ever seen God do something amazing within your life you had no explanation for whatsoever? And then some of you have been so spiritually dead, you've had 10 million of these things happen and it's went right over your head and you haven't known it. And man, if I was you, I would start yearning for the heart of King Jesus and say, Holy Spirit, I don't want to mess any of this up. I don't want to miss any of this. Man, I want to be so aware of your kingdom. But if you're so aware of yourself, you miss your awareness of the kingdom. And here's the deal. Part of the, part of the big thing of really seeing the spirit of God line you up so that you're at the right place at the right time is this. Acknowledge him in all of your ways and he will direct your path. If God moves just a little bit, man, you acknowledge it and you go, hey, that was the Lord. That was the Lord and I'm paying attention to that. I'm going to pay attention to that. Hallelujah. Well, in verse two, <laughs> In verse 2, it says this, that once we are committed to this whole process of the renewing of our mind, which is actually committed to the transformation of my life, because how this works is, when I get saved, my spirit is 100% saved. It can't be any more saved than it is. But my mind is now in the process of being saved. And then someday, my body will be saved. Your body and my body right now are dying. As soon as, we, as soon as we were born, we entered into a timeline that says that there is a beginning and there is an ending. But there is a paradox, and the paradox is we have a spirit within us now that is of God Almighty himself that has no end and has no beginning. And so how do, we, how do we live in these two different worlds? How we live in it is this. My spirit is 100% saved. My mind is in the process of being saved. And someday, my mortal body will be saved. Just like my spirit is saved. Amen. Y'all think I'm hard to deal with now? Wait till I got a glorified body. Amen. I want a supernatural mustache that curls all the way up on both sides. That's what I want. And I want it to move around and do weird things. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm thinking all kinds of cool things I want to be able to do when I'm no longer a fat old dude. Amen. Man, I, the brewer gene. We call that the brewer gene. Man, old Brother Barrett, my grandson Brisket, he just got through finish doing his big time, his first baseball team. And man, he did so good. And they got second place. Hallelujah. Is that okay if I tell you all that? Yeah, thank you, Jesus. And the most athletic thing he did all year was he got hit by the ball. Because he's a brewer. Hallelujah. Brewers don't run. <laughs> So we just teach our grandkids that play baseball. Just let it hit you. Let it hit you. Just take one for the team. You'll make it to first base. Let it hit you. Do not step out of the batter. It's like, boom, got him. Yay! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> that is so true, what I just said. Now... <laughs> Once we're committed to this process, the Word of God says in the second verse that we can prove, we can prove, we can prove what is the good, what is the acceptable, and what is the perfect will of God. So when you prove something, it's very interesting. It's like, okay, hey, this is the math equation. Okay, now prove it. Show me that that is true. Show me. It's where you work it out and there's an infallible proof that goes with it. And you say, okay, um, you know, the, the, there's all kinds of things that you have to prove. You have to prove those things. The word of God is one of those things and the will of God is one of those things. Now, Jesus would prove the word of God all the time by doing this. This day, this scripture is fulfilled within your ears. When he got up and when he was on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which means open up your Bibles to Psalms 22. That's what that means. Because that's what Psalms 22 starts off with. Now, not in the King James Bible, but in the Amplified Bible, you know what the last words of Psalms 22 are? It is finished. Hallelujah. 
And it's like he's up there screaming, look at Psalms 22. It was written a thousand years before right now, and it's all about this very moment. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. I'm proving to you and showing you that the word of God is true. Man, guys, there needs to be an attitude among us as believers where we say, I'm going to show you that the word of God is true. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to show you that God Almighty is faithful. Well, just exactly like that, when it comes to the will of God, we have to be able to prove or to be able to tangibly show without any doubt whatsoever three different stages of the will of God. Now, these three different stages are very interesting to me because I love the whole thing about three stages. And if you guys have my book, Numbers That Preach, beginning on page 35, I have six pages of examples of threes, right? You know, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, past, present, future, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, faith, hope, the love of God, right? Outer court, inner court, most holy place, sun, moon, stars, all that, right? And I got six pages of examples of that. It's like, this is a big deal. First stage, most people can get into the first stage. Second stage, just a few people can get into it. And third stage, one out of a million people will get into third stage Christianity, living with Jesus in that third stage, the most holy place, that perfect place. Well, that's what this word says, that when it comes to the will of God, you are supposed to prove through the condition of your life being transformed by the renewing of your mind what the will of God is in three different categories. The first one is good. Everybody say good. good. I want to tell you about the good, the goodness of God. And I want to talk to you about when God says something is good, God always says something is good when it's chaotic, but it has the potential of promise within it. So the potential of promise is a really big deal to the Lord. And it's a bigger deal than the chaos Okay, so we make a bigger deal out of the chaos, but God Almighty will make a big deal out of the potential of promise within it, and he'll call it good. He did that in the Genesis story at the end of every single day in the midst of planets smashing and all kinds of craziness happening. It's just, I'm telling you that, it's nuts. And at the end of every single day, he's, God, God says it's good. He's like, no, there's a plan. There's a potential of promise. I am going to dismiss the momentary chaos and the mess, and I'm just going to declare it's good. So one of the things that God does whenever it comes to his will is you can literally stand in something that is not his will, but you can declare the word of God in the midst of it because there's a potential of redemption. There's potential of order out of the chaos. There's potential of, you know what? This is a big, huge mess, but I have a word from the Lord and the word from the Lord of my life is this. And that's when you stand in that place that is really scary to stand in. And, and nobody knows what it's like to stand in that place until you stand in it by yourself and you say, okay, what's real is this has happened. What's real is this, I'm not saying it's not real, but I am saying this, that in the midst of this chaos and this hell, and in the midst of this darkness, oh, I have a word from the Lord. And the word for the Lord in the assignment of God within my own life says whatever it says. And so you call it good. Now you're calling it good when it don't look good. Amen. You're calling it good when it doesn't look good. But guys, can I just tell you this? You're supposed to prove that place. And that sounds like it's so difficult, but it's actually kindergarten stuff compared to the perfect will of God, which we're, we're going to get there here in just a second. I'm not going to keep you here all night. Everybody good? Yeah. Amen. Come on. Hang in there with me. Listen, I know, I know we all got to work tomorrow. We all got a big day tomorrow. I know we got kids. I totally get it. I promise you I'm not going to keep you here all night. Give me another 10 minutes or so. Okay? All right. So, so when it comes to the good will of God, it's things that you call good because you know the Lord and because you know his heart and because you know his character. And you stand in this place just like, just like Martha. Okay? Martha, one of my little girls in Mexico that we rescued. Um, Guys, there's so many things that go with Martha, but one of the things I'm going to just tell you this is whenever we sent her to the doctor, and mind you, she was, she was a 12-year-old little girl, and she'd been prostituted. I don't, I don't want to go off into big detail about it, but I'm just going to just say this. We found the DNA of over 100 men connected to her body, and she's 12. And she had every single kind of disease that you could possibly imagine. And I'm talking about every kind of sexual disease, including AIDS, that little girl had. And she had stuff I'd never even heard of before. 
And we had to send her to go have surgery, like we do so many little girls that we rescue. They had to have surgical procedures to have their bodies put back together again. All the horrors and the mess that goes into all that. Here's what we did, and this is what I want to tell you. We stood in that, and instead of being overwhelmed and so sad, which we have to fight that off all the time, which is another reason why I'm a little bit hacked off these days, because we are so neck deep in so many rescues, and the body of Jesus yawns. And I'm like, wake up! This is coming to your house. And you'd better sow into this. You don't think that this sexualization is coming to your kids and your grandkids? You, you are out to lunch. It's coming to your house. You have better had sown into this if you want to reap in your family and say, it ain't, ain't going to get my kids. Amen. So I'm like, hey man, let's do this. So I, I'm like, in the midst of that terrible place, we just go, my God, that is, that's one of the worst things I've seen in a long, long, long time. Here's the deal. We're like, but I know Jesus. And I know that Jesus hates for this little girl to be diseased and for her body to be so broken. Now look, I didn't have another word I didn't have a prophetic word. I didn't have a, you know, I didn't have a boom moment where thus saith the Lord God, she shall be healed. I just had the written word of God and I had the knowledge of the character of the Lord. That's it, that's all I had. And can I just tell you, that's all you need. That's all you need to be able to stand in the midst of something terrible and say, but the goodness of God is here. And so, I, before I even knew what I was doing, when I went down there to go meet her that first time, and her, her handlers were telling me the issues, and we saw that there's all this stuff, and we saw what had happened to her, and, we, and then I heard her physical body, and we knew what had happened, and there's another little girl that we had just rescued uh, in the same week that was even in a worse place than she was, and all these terrible things that had happened to her, and we were just standing there at this, and I'm just like, yeah, but... Yeah, but I know Jesus. And if I can have a heart for this little girl, how much more so does the Spirit of the Lord have a heart for this little girl? Okay, I wanna just tell you, to make a long story short, that little girl does not have one single disease because Jesus healed her of every single disease she had. And it is doctor confirmed and verified on the Mexican side of the border and in Houston, Texas, she does not have any of those diseases. And it's because we stood in such a horrible place and we called it good because it had the potential of promise. Okay? Now, now the problem, and, and I haven't, I gotta get off into acceptable, which means compatible with his presence. And then we gotta get off into perfect, which means all the way finished. It doesn't mean flawless. Perfect means all the way finished. Okay? And it's like, well, I, I don't think that that's, that's what it means. Well, that's why when Jesus was talking to the church in Revelation, and man, if you guys, would you, would y'all please put Revelation chapter three, verse two up for me, please? I know it's the very last verse on there. Revelation three, two, he says this, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Do you know what he's saying to the church? I've heard you talk about you were gonna do something. I've heard you, I've heard you have committees and vote on if you're gonna do something, but I don't see anything. Your works are not perfect. In other words, you're saying, hey, we have a commitment to being committed, but we haven't actually committed to getting it done. Exactly. Like one of these days, we're gonna come up with enough money to actually make a difference. That is ludicrous and silly and bogus. And here's, can I just say, a lot of people in the body of Jesus, the reason why they're not doing anything, well, we're not sure of the will of God. Well, hell is full of people that don't know the will of God. And the church shouldn't be full of people who don't know the will of God. Amen. And it's like, well, I don't know the will of God. Okay, the reason why you don't know the will of God is because you don't know God personally. If you know God Almighty personally, you will know the will of God. Because the first understanding of the will of God is not this mysterious thing where we go, okay, well, I believe in the sovereignty of the Lord. Of course we believe in the sovereignty of the Lord. Absolutely, I believe in the sovereignty of the Lord. Man, listen, Jesus is gonna have his way ultimately. But I wanna just tell you this, his greatest desire is that none should perish. Now I'm gonna ask you this, does anybody perish? 
Yes. So in that sense, his will is not sovereign. Everybody's like, wait a minute, I think that might be blasphemous. No. No. I'm going to ask you again. Does Jesus want people to perish? Is it his will? No. He wants none to perish. Okay, now I'm going to ask you this. Do people perish? Okay, so now we're not talking about the sovereign will of God. We're talking about something different. And we have to be able to be grown up enough to say, I can't have lazy faith and lazy theology. Incredibly lazy theology. I cannot have that and that be an excuse when I stand before God and God says, hey, dude, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you change that? Why didn't you fix that? Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you step in? Why didn't you pray? Why didn't you make a de declaration? And then you say, well, who could know your will? That ain't gonna fly with him. And it might fly with your denomination, but it will not fly with this holy and righteous judge. But he's like, because he's gonna say, you were supposed to know my will. If you look up the word will, when it comes to the New Testament, if you look it up, I'm gonna show you what it says in the actual Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and here it is. It's number 2307, and this is what it says. It's the Greek word, and it means to desire or to wish. Properly, a desire, a wish, and often referring to God's preferred will. Now, like, okay, what does that mean? It means this. Okay, if I'm standing in a place that is the scariest place that I've ever seen, I've got one little girl over here who has been tortured. Her, her little brother was murdered in front of her, and while she was experiencing that kind of terror, they sold her body. And that's happening. That's a true story. And on the same day that I'm talking to her and she's telling me the story about this murder that took place, in the midst of that unbelievable horror and darkness, I'm talking to another 12-year-old little girl who is literally, her body has literally been offered on a Luciferian sexual idol. And she's diseased and she's broken and she is messed up and borderline insane. And I'm standing there in the midst of all that, and I'm in the midst of two scary situations, trying to figure out what the commitment of our church should be, what my personal commitment should be, what we should do, how we should do it. And I'm standing there in the midst of all this. I want to tell you something. I do not need to be, but I don't know what the will of God is. Because I know what the will of God is. And you know how I know that it's God's will to heal that little girl? Because there's no sexual diseases in heaven. He doesn't allow it in heaven. And see, our job is to say, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. So it's like, I don't have to go, well, gee, I wonder if God is good enough to not want this little girl to have this disease. Are you high? You say you know God. How could you not know what God's wish or God's heart is? It's because you're not a man after God's own heart. See, that's what David was. David was all about seeing the will of God moved into the earth realm. And like, and how does the Old Testament put that? He was a man after God's own heart. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And when he looked, he didn't invoke a tabernacle like Moses had. He invoked a tabernacle that looked more like heaven. And he saw that in heaven, everybody had access to the Lord and that it was 24 hours praise and worship. So he brought heaven to earth. And he said, that's the will of the Lord. So my first understanding is this, the will of God literally has to do with, the, you know, well, this is what I know about Jesus, and I'm going to move in that, and I'm going to do something in his name. Let's just say that I killed over last week, and then you say, you know what, Troy, you know, Troy was a knucklehead, and he's hard to get along with sometimes, but man, he had a cool mustache, and I really liked him. So here's what I'm going to do. You know what, Troy's whole heart, man, was all about rescuing people who needed to be rescued, and he really didn't care. He didn't care what they needed to be rescued from. And he didn't care who they were or how they, he just loved rescue. He loved redemption. I think in his name, I'm going to do something like that. There it is. You just did my will according to my name. That's it. It's, it's not hard at all to know the will of God. You have to know the heart of the Father and just go, this is what I know about Jesus. God Almighty loves little girls that everybody else abuses. This is what I know. He hates those kinds of, kinds of diseases, and he doesn't want her life to be about this mess. I know this, so I think I'm going to go after those things, and I'm going to start believing God, and I'm going to start operating in the will of God, and whatever I ask according to his will, he will answer it, and he did. That little girl is completely healed. Amen. 
So you can literally stand in the midst of chaos, in the midst of all kinds of hell, in the midst of all kinds of darkness, and you can still bring the goodness of God and say, there's potential for redemption here simply because I know Jesus. And Christ in me is the hope of glory. And this is part of doing business. This is part of the, of the whole thing of doing business in the kingdom. It's the exchange between heaven and earth where God Almighty wants to look at his sons and his daughters and as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these he has given power to be called the sons of God. Amen. That's not a gender bias uh, statement. It is a full inheritance for both genders. Amen. The sons of God. You are literally called the sons of God because you're led by the Spirit. What is that? He wants to be able to look down at his sons and his daughters and go, these people love me and they're trying to transfer, they're seeing their lives transform. So now they're trying to conform their world to how their lives are transformed instead of, instead of conforming their lives to the world. And they're doing this in my name and they are doing this. This is my will. They have learned this from me. And now they are outperforming my will. God Almighty wants to look over at the, at the Iranian church and go, I love my Persian kids who are here in this place who stand in the midst of the Muslim hordes and they fight unbelievable persecution and they still love me enough to tell everybody about Jesus. He expects to find his will on the earth. Right? He wants to look at the American church and say, you know what? These are people that would not back up. They would not back down. They had every opportunity in the world to be wrapped up in every form of carnality that you can possibly imagine. But they considered it a great privilege to be holy before the Lord. He wants to be able to find his will upon the earth. Amen. And he wants to see his children performing his will, which means demonstrating his character. And whatever the Lord's wish would be within a situation, say, I'm going to make that happen. And here the church has been saying for years, well, we're not sure what the will of God is. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, hell, you, hell will welcome people who in the name of Jesus have a lazy theology and say, well, who can know the will of God? As if, as if there's a problem with God's character and accuse the Lord and say to him, well, you know why? He made himself so mysterious and he's so daggum scary. I mean, we just decided to never mess with his will. That's not going to fly with him. He has showed you. I mean, who is Jesus to you? What's your testimony? Is there anybody in here where you can say, Jesus is my healer? Yeah. Well, then heal in the name of Jesus. Amen. Is there anybody in here who can say, Jesus is my sanity? Yeah. Well, then bring sanity. Is there anybody in here who can say, Jesus is my stability? Yeah. Then be stable in the name of King Jesus and perform the will of God. We could go on and on and on about our testimony of who Jesus is, but let's move off into the acceptable will of God. We go from the chaos of the mess and just say, you know what, I'm gonna hold the promise in the midst of this mess. Mama, grandmama, hold the promise of your kids and your children in the midst of their mess. When they're losing their mind, if they come in drunk, God forbid, if they go out and run amok, if they act stupid, if they start to get high and act a fool, you'd be the one person that stands in the midst of that terrible darkness and say, I know what God's promise is. I know his character. I know how good he is to me. And I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And hold on to that. And, and prove the will of God in that. Amen. And then you move into the acceptable, and the acceptable is an interesting part to me because it has to do with more of a compatibility of his manifest presence. In the acceptable realm, it's not habitation, it's visitation. Okay? And what I mean by that is whenever, if, you, if you're going to walk in the acceptable will of God, that means it looks more like heaven than it looks like hell. In the good place, it's not like that. It looks like hell, but heaven's hidden in it. Amen. And that's the good place. Amen. By the way, the very end of that, very end of that chapter says, do not be overcome by the world, but overcome evil with good. That's how that chapter ends. You overcome evil with good. What is that? Stepping into the midst of that horrible, scary, chaotic place and going, I got a promise from the Lord. I know God's character. And devil, you shouldn't have never woke me up. I'm telling you, you need to hope and pray the devil wakes you up so that you can just go spider monkey on him. <laughs> Amen. And just go, I'm not going to sit around here in fear and tremble in my own bed. It's my bed. Do you know how disgusting that is to me for me to be going, I'm scared in my own bed? Man, I got more guns than Davy Crockett. <laughs> Why would I be scared? 
And then I know the word of God. Like, I'm not going to lay here and be scared of some devil in my house. This is my house. Amen. Get out of my house. And since you woke me up, let's just invade other folks' houses. Holy Spirit, give me some names and let's just get them in the name of King Jesus. Oh, that's a good name. Let's go. Let's go. Pastor Jerry and I was, was at a restaurant. We went out on that big deep sea fish. And by the way, the movie of that comes out on ODX this coming Friday. It's called Fishing for a Miracle. And it's really good. It's, it's really good. Our team's been working on it for a long time. It's a, it's a show we put together just for ODX. I filmed most of it just with my iPhone out there in that big, terrible storm. My hair's going everywhere. And I caught a 100-pound yellowfin tuna. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay. And so I'm like, hallelujah. So we filmed all that, and we made a movie out of it, and it'll be on ODX on Friday. Okay, so... Uh, the last day, we went to get on the plane. Couldn't get on the plane. Storms were here. Leanna had to preach on that Sunday. And I just called her and said, baby, I can't get home. And would you preach? And she said, yeah, I will. So she preaches for me. Well, me and Jerry went to the restaurant. And we went to go eat a big old breakfast uh, before we went to the airport. And we're going to try it again. We spent six hours uh, at the airport. Now we're going to go back. We're going to try it again and see, if, and see if we can't get home. And then a lady tells me, she's got my dad gum waitress tells me, just while we're just talking, I'm saying, hey, man, what's the biggest thing going on in your world right now? It's one of the things I always ask waiters and waitresses. Number one, if a waitress comes and tells me, hi, my name is Jenny, and I'm going to be your server, I stop her and go, well, hey, my name is Troy, and this is my wife, Leanna. Where else in the world do you only halfway introduce each other? That is so stupid to me that people let that go on. Yeah, yeah, I just need this, whatever. Do not treat them like a slave. That is not your slave. And you don't treat them like a slave. You tell them your name, and you connect with them. Like, well, I don't want to do any of that. Then stay home and eat a TV dinner. <laughs> Hallelujah. And if you ain't going to take a tip, don't go to no restaurant. You should have a lot of cash with you that you carry around just to be a blessing to somebody because you're going to give them a word of God and you're going to make an impact upon their life. They're like, well, I, don't, I just don't believe in that. Well, I wish the body of Jesus would have a simple revelation that there could be a tremendous rev revival in America just simply through the waiters and waitresses. Amen. Who are forced to talk to you. They are forced to speak to you. I, it's just so simple to me. You know, like, well, I don't have that kind of personality. Well, I got enough personality for all of us. You can borrow some of mine. So bottom line is, she tells me, even though I've only known her for two minutes, she says, well, biggest thing going on in my life is I have stage four colon rectal cancer. I'm like, oh, I just started laughing. Like, well, I didn't see that coming this morning. And I told Jerry, I said, oh, man, it's going to be a good day. And that's exactly the first thing she said to me when she told me, oh, yeah, I've got colon rectal cancer in stage four. I'm months away from being dead, and I'll probably have to work until the day that I die. I just turned to Jerry and went, man, today's going to be a great day. <laughs> like, why? Because I know Jesus. I didn't go in there with a word for somebody with colon cancer. I went in there and just said, I'm just ready for Jesus to bring me something. Let's see what he does because I know Jesus. And if I know Jesus, I know his will. Come on. So we just told her, I said, well, you, you got some break time? Sit down here. And dude, I'd already got my food. And I'm like, you know, because they had a buffet. I'm like, you want to bite? She's like, no, I'm good. Like, what a weirdo. So we'll sit down and talk to us about this. Why are you still working? What's going on? What's going on? Okay, before I see, listen, do I believe that God Almighty wants to heal her? Yes. Okay, yes, I do. Okay, why else would I believe that? Why else would I believe that God Almighty has a tremendous miracle for this woman? Can anybody imagine why else I would believe that? Because God brought her to me, and he knows I'm the crazy person who believes in that. He didn't take it to the pansy Christians that were sitting at the table next to me. We don't want to get involved. Yeah, yeah. No, he brought her to me. And I'm the guy who believes in healing. Oh, the devil, a devil of cancer might chase me. Wee, wee. Oh, King Jesus. So I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm to go, okay, this is going to be a good day. Because I wasn't looking for this. I was looking for a breakfast buffet and the Lord brought me this chick with cancer. She's going to get healed. It's obvious to me she's going to get healed. Simply because I know Jesus, and that's how you perform, and that's how you prove the will of God. 
Well, I want to tell you, we prayed for her healing, didn't see it happen immediately, but I'll tell you what we did see happen was we found out, hey, how much money do you make a month? And I'm just going to tell you, she makes $3,000 a month working there at that place. And she goes, that's why I can't quit. I said, quit, and I'll pay you $3,000 a month. Why? So that she can be around her kids and she can actually go to the doctor and she can go through her chemo at her house and not at the work. They're like, well, I ain't got no $3,000 a month to give anybody. Well, neither do I. And I went ahead and made the commitment. And then I told my wife about it afterwards. Woohoo! <laughs> it's like, why would I not do? Okay, so that's my skin in the game to see Jesus heal, heal this chick. Amen. That's the will of God. That's how the will of God works. It's not a mystery. It's not like this really weird thing. We're like, ooh, it's so weird. It's so spooky. And so, no, that's you being lazy. Who has Jesus been to you? And such as you have, you give unto others. Finally, the last one is the perfect will of God. And I would just say that perfection is not what you and I call perfection. We call perfection flawlessness. That's not what God calls it. He calls it perfect. What is something that's perfect? It's when it's, it's when it's actually done. So remember, whenever he spoke to the church in Revelation, he goes, your works are not perfect. In other words, I, he's like, I look and I got nothing. Where is it? Where is it? Oh man, you're gonna change the world someday. Man, you're gonna write a book someday. You're gonna rescue somebody someday. Man, you're going to get on the radio someday. Man, you're going to help a widow lady someday. Man, you're going to see to it that the kids at school are fed someday. Man, you're going to do this, you're going to do that someday. You prayed about it, you talked about it, you believed for it, and yet your works are not perfect. Amen. Are you with me on that? And it's like, man, okay, Pastor Rory, that's not fair because I didn't have the means to be able to get this thing done. Look, I'm not in, I promise you, I'm not judging you as far as what you've done and what you've not done. I'm telling you what the perfect will of God is. And this is what it is when you've actually done it. And friends, most people do not do the will of God. They like the idea of doing the will of God, but they do not get committed to do that. A lot of people like the idea of being married. Amen. So, man, I'm going to fall in love with some beautiful woman. My God. And she's going to love me and she's going to think I'm cool. Okay, well, then you two cats are going to have to wake up together and then you're going to have to live life together and you're still going to have to think each other is cool when it ain't cool. And you're going to have to be committed to that. And you're going to have to be faithful and you're going to have to make it look really easy when it is not easy. Like, your marriage isn't easy? No, it is not easy. I guarantee you, my, my marriage is a lot easier than a whole bunch of y'all's. promise you that, man. I wouldn't trade for one single person on this planet anybody else's marriage. Y'all are all married to crazy people. <laughs> now that I've said all that, I want to just tell you this, man. I think it's, I think it's amazing, and I, I've been married for 34 years, and I want to just tell you, no, there have been times it has not been easy for us to be married. And do you know why? I want to tell you why. Because I'm a boy, and she's a girl. There you go. Amen. That makes it very difficult sometimes just to be standing on the same roof because you're a dude and she's not. And like, why can I not have one more animal head in my house? Why? And why do we need that little dog in the house? Why do we need that little dog? We already have dogs. We don't need any other dogs. No, we do not. Why do we need that bathtub if we have a shower? Why? Why do we need that? Because she thinks it's cool. And because she's a girl. And she has the right to be a girl. And so you have to work through it and then you have to decide what it is that you're gonna be offended or what you're not gonna be offended at if that is your battle because you're committed to each other. And your battle might be something completely different because you're not committed or somebody is not committed within your marriage. But no, I have a wife who's committed to being married to me and she loves me. And I, I, oh my God, I love her so much. I promise you, she is so cool. She is, she's really cool. I, I close with this and just say this. The perfect will of God is when the will of God is actually done. It showed up in the darkness and nobody saw it but you. And then you worked it and worked it and worked it until God could start showing up within that capacity. 
the acceptable will of God. And then you worked it and worked it and worked it until it was fully established and the thing actually became fruitful. And friends, it's so basic that we should occupy or we should do kingdom business until Jesus comes back. You guys know those verses, right? That we should occupy. And some, and some verses say, some, some modern translations say to do business. Do you know what Jesus said whenever Mary came to get him? He said, woman, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And I think Mary took off her shoe and spanked him is what I think. It's not in the Bible. But the Bible says after that, he made himself subject to them. That's what it says. Read it. She said, oh, no, you did not say that to me. I've been looking for you for three days. Like, where have you been? Woman, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? I got some business. Let me show you this shoe. And the Bible says, and he became subject unto them from that day forward. It's, it's in the Bible, I promise you, and it's hilarious to me. Okay, what was he doing? He was about his father's business. What does that mean? It means this, he's in the business of exchanging what the father has and bringing it from heaven into the planet earth. And that's what it is that we're supposed to be doing, which is the will of the Lord. I wanna ask everybody to stand up. Oh my goodness, I was on a road tonight. Thank y'all for putting up with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you wanna know what God's will is for your life, and if you're like, I'm not real sure, you just need to look no further than Matthew chapter 10. The Bible says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Remember how you have received Jesus and then do that. If Jesus has been good to you when nobody else was good to you, then you be good to people that nobody else is good to and do his will. Amen. If Jesus had mercy on you, and when nobody else would have had mercy on you, then you go have mercy on other people the way that Jesus has had mercy on you and do his will. Remember what it says here, freely you have received, so freely give. So when I see this thing right here, like, okay, I don't know if I'm supposed to have a pink house or a blue house. Here's what God says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Like, well, I'm not real sure if I should work at McDonald's or if I should work at Burger King. What is the will of God? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Well, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to watch Fox News or CNN. Well, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. However you have received Jesus, give that to other people and do the will of God. And don't make it religious. Don't make it religious. There's nothing religious about it. It's just your relationship with King Jesus. So Father, I wanna pray God for every single one of us, God, as your children. And God, we love you so much. God, we're so grateful for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, give us a grace for the performance of your will in the realm of the good, in the realm of the acceptable, and then in the realm of the perfect or made or finished all the way. Father, I pray God that you would look at us as a church and as a people, and as a family, and as a community, and as a tribe. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you would look at us and find our works perfect. God, that we would actually finish the things we've started. Help us, Lord God, sir, not to bell. And God, I lift up my friends that are in here. Everybody say, King Jesus, I repent of not knowing your will. Your will be done and your kingdom come in this world and in this life in the name of Jesus.